on this edition of the Fifth Estate. It's the dirty secret of pro sports. These pills just perpetuated a problem and didn't, didn't come close to solving it. They made it worse. He was crushing them up and snorting them. We know that. You know, and you walk into a table and they just got, you know, 30 needles lined up and guys walk by to stick you, wipe you with a cloth and you keep walking. The police investigation, drug raids, tragic death. Derek is dead. Derek is dead. Ronnie, he's dead. Derek is dead. He just kept screaming it. It's the problem that team doctors don't want to face. I think, you know, we'd like to talk to you about Derek Bugard and the prescriptions you wrote for him just the year that he died. Ethically, they want to say we're there for the player and health is first. But that's not the reality of pro sports. The reality of pro sports is winning is first because money is first. I'm Bob McEwen in New York City with the untold story of prescription drug addiction and pro sports. This is the Fifth Estate. It was a Friday, May 13th, 2011, at an upscale condominium in Minneapolis, Minnesota. NHL player Derek Bugard has been found dead at his home. He just finished his first season playing with the New York Rangers. The death of any 28-year-old would be tragic. Derek Bugard's was that and more. From a big, close family, the Canadian kid who fulfilled his hockey dream to become, for some, an NHL folk hero. But also, the symbol of a fatal flaw in professional sports. A toxicology report shows Bugard died from a combination of alcohol and painkillers. The death was ruled an accident, an unintentional overdose of alcohol and the painkiller oxycodone. But as we'll show you, it was an accident waiting to happen because the fate of Derek Bugard is a troubling example of how highly trained professional athletes can become dangerously addicted to pills, medication prescribed for them by their own team doctors. Randy, here you go. Come on. Come on. Good girl. It's a story that couldn't be told without this man, Derek's father, Len Bugard, left with his son's memory and a mission some of the stuff that, uh, you know, was being said about Derek and it just wasn't ringing true. When he retired after three decades as an RCMP officer, he had a single goal, to apply his police experience and investigative techniques to discover who provided the pills to which his son became addicted. Yeah, no, basically it's, uh, you know, that uh, I look at it as, I guess, all right, uh, you know, you uh, were culpable in Derek's death, uh, you enabled Derek's death, but there's no accountability, you don't have to answer for it. So, and with Derek as well, that Derek's not the only player that's in this situation. Like a detective, Len Bugard set out to piece together the supply chain that facilitated his son's addiction. No easy task, because the medical records team doctors provided contained virtually no information about Derek's prescription history or the many medications he took. But the former Mountie wouldn't take no for an answer. With ingenuity and legwork, he finally pieced together this. The shocking list of drugs his son had been given in the NHL, page after page of prescriptions, nearly 200 of them written by two dozen doctors, for thousands and thousands of tablets of powerful painkillers and other dangerous drugs. Among the drugs Derek Bugard received most frequently, the painkillers hydrocodone and oxycodone, and the sleeping aid Ambien. We showed that list to Dr. David Yerling, head of pharmacology at Sunnybrook Hospital and a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. He didn't need to be given prescriptions like this over and over again. Uh, the people who wrote those prescriptions should have known, and I suspect they probably did know, that what he really needed was help. Uh, these pills uh, just perpetuated a problem and didn't, didn't come close to solving it. They made it worse. Just the, sh the sheer number of, of prescriptions that were written, uh, the only word that comes to mind is astonishing. 
And we sought a second opinion on Derek Bugard's prescription history from Dr. Matt McCarthy, a former professional baseball player, now with Cornell Medical Center in New York. And again, no single prescription was a concern, but it was the quantity and also the sheer number of providers. There were so many people prescribing medications for this man. Drafted by the Major League Anaheim Angels, Matt McCarthy has known team doctors both as a pro athlete and a medical colleague. Yeah, it's, it's a tricky situation, um, and it's not one that I would like to be in. You know, the, the, the pressures that a team physician faces are so different than what the average doctor in the community faces. And the ones who can get players back on the ice are going to stick around, and they're going to have very successful careers as team doctors. And it's, uh, it, there's just a pressure there that the average doc doesn't see. In fact, most big league sports franchises have a number of team doctors with various specialties general practitioner, orthopedist, dentist. Players are free to consult their own physicians, but in practice, most will be treated by the doctors chosen by and responsible to the team. They're also the ones who write most prescriptions for team members. For example, according to the list of medications given to Derek Bugard when he was with the Minnesota Wild, the names of two physicians appear most frequently. The Wild Medical Director Sheldon Burns, and team doctor Dan Peterson. And when Derek was a New York Ranger, the majority of prescriptions came from one of the team doctors, Ronald Weissman. But we're not talking about aspirin. The painkillers most often prescribed for Bugard are hydrocodone and oxycodone, both opium derivatives and highly addictive narcotics. Think of it this way. If the painkilling strength of aspirin is one and Tylenol is two, then hydrocodone could be seven, and oxycodone eight or more. It's an approximation, but you get the idea. Two of the biggest boys in the NHL, King and Bugard. Of course, as the NHL's heavyweight champion, there often were good reasons to prescribe painkillers for him. He had dental reconstruction, surgery on a much broken nose, operations on his shoulder, injuries to back, ribs, foot, hand, and face, just to name a few. Super heavyweight bout. Pulitzer Prize winner John Branch of the New York Times wrote Bugard's biography, Boy on Ice. He says he often kept the pressures of the game, physical and psychological, to himself. He was very injured. He had a lot of injuries that he never admitted to. I think a lot of um, mental anguish Mm -hmm. that he didn't let a lot of people in on. And I think it's part of the code. I mean, you mentioned the code. I think part of the code is you don't complain. Who are you to complain? You know, you've got the world right here. But he obviously was complaining to someone. According to the records obtained by his father, there were so many heavy-duty drugs in short periods of time. For example, after he lost a tooth in a fight in October 2008. During the course of a month, the treatments that he received, that he got approximately 190 oxycodone pills or hydrocodone pills. 190 in a he month? Got, he got eight prescriptions from dentists and from doctors. And there would be another torrent of hydrocodone and oxycodone in April 2009. This time, 220 tablets in one month. In that single season with the wild, Derek Bugard got over 1,000 tablets of various medications, including almost 700 pain-killing pills, prescribed by eight different Minnesota team doctors. And one wonders if they're talking to one another, if, they, if there is a, a repository where they know that someone else on the team roster of physicians has been giving him the same thing. Yeah, I don't know if there was or not. I think it's fair to say that patients often do go to more than one physician, but, but patients who've had a history of substance abuse generally shouldn't be under the care of multiple different physicians, each of whom is prescribing drugs that are abusable. It's just generally not a good idea. But pain pills were just part of the problem. That summer of 2009, Derek Bugard was also given large quantities of another medication commonly used by professional athletes traveling and playing in different time zones, the sleeping aid called Ambien. In less than four months, Minnesota team doctors Sheldon Burns and Dan Peterson prescribed about 200 Ambien tablets to Bugard, though it's intended for short-term use and not for those with addiction issues. 
Sports writer John Branch believes by then, Bugard was already at the point of no return, addicted to Ambien and the painkillers. And I think that's the point where he became solely addicted, but also came to the realization that, wow, I can get these from this doctor, and I can also get them from this doctor, and they don't apparently talk to one another. But, you know, pain pills are a, uh, are a commodity in these leagues, and, and these players are pretty good about figuring out where to get them. Derek's father tried everything to convince his son to get medical help. He, he didn't want help. He said, no, I've got to do this on my own. I can handle it, because he didn't want anybody to know, because he was, he was very embarrassed, uh, you know, that uh, this had, had come out and that, you know, that I was aware of it, et cetera. So. And uh, I said, no, you can't do it by yourself. You're going to need help. When we come back, why hockey is not the only professional sport resistant to medical change. They're like, no, there's no doctor in the world that would do that. I'm like, well, there's 32 doctors that I know that do it all around the NFL. They say if hockey is a contact sport, then pro football is a collision sport with the injuries, painkillers, and pressures on team doctors to match. Jeremy Newbury retired in 2009 after 11 seasons in the National Football League, mostly as an all-pro center for the San Francisco 49ers. He describes a dressing room assembly line for painkilling injections. So the needles are, the hypodermic syringes are preloaded. Preloaded, they have them all ready to go. And I mean, literally, they'll clear 30 people out within three minutes. According to Newbury, his game day routine revolved around one thing, drugs. I'd show up on crutches in a walking boot, um, you know, literally couldn't walk. And I would get an injection or two into my ankle or knee or whatever it was, get my knee drained, get an injection into my ankle, get a shot of Toradol in my butt, and then I would take three or four Vicodin before the game, come back in, repeat the same surgeries with the injections at halftime, and then take another handful of Vicodin, and then after the game be back on crutches again because I couldn't walk because the painkillers were wearing off. Newbury says his doctors now blame those repeated injections of the anti-inflammatory painkiller Toradol, hundreds of them, for causing his kidneys to fail. I probably had 200 shots of Toradol. So, I mean, you're, <laughs> you're a big guy, Jeremy, but that's an exorbitant amount of right. that drug. And, and you tell a normal doctor that, and they kind of laugh, and they're like, no, no you, really, you didn't have that many. I'm like, no, I, every single game I've played for the last 11 years, I'm, I've had Toradol. And they're like, no, there's no doctor in the world that would do that. I'm like, well, there's 32 doctors that I know that do it all around the NFL. Bags were searched, team doctors questioned as part of a DEA investigation into prescription drug abuse and potential violations of the Controlled Substances Act. The recent raids of three NFL teams by agents of the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration were part of a DEA investigation into the abuse of prescription medication in pro football. That's not news to Jeremy Newbury. Now in stage three kidney failure, he's accepted he may need dialysis and a transplant in the not distant future. It's why Newbury's part of a growing movement to challenge the medical status quo in pro sports. You know, it, it's, it's taken its toll now. A lot of these guys that are in this lawsuit have bad kidneys, they got bad hearts. Uh, you know, we just don't know what all these medications were doing to our bodies. Super Bowl winning quarterback Jim McMahon is among 1,300 former NFLers who've sued the league, claiming the indiscriminate use of medication like painkillers has adversely affected their long-term health. And the Canadian Football League Championship game is underway. The long-term health of Canadian football players is something I happen to know a bit about. Casada takes the snap from his Yale center, Bob McEwen. In the golden era of the Canadian Football League, I was the mild-mannered number 42 for the Grey Cup champion Ottawa Rough Riders. Let's go! Let's go! They may have been the good old days for the CFL, but anyone who played when I did knows they were the bad old days for locker room medicine. And I've had the concussions and knee surgery and arthritis to prove it. Back then, medications were often dispensed, not by doctors, but trainers. No medical degree or prescriptions necessary. Amphetamines and sleeping pills were in jars in the training room. 
steroids were not against league rules then. Pain-killing injections available upon request. And no one ever used the terms impact on long-term health or adverse side effects. And the situation was substantially the same in the NFL of the 80s and 90s, when Rob Heizenga was hired as the Los Angeles Raider team doctor and found medication available in the training room 24-7. When I joined the team, I was very, very unpopular for the first year when I put an end to that uh, because they had ready access to essentially any pill they wanted any time. Physician for a Super Bowl champion, he says the Raiders then, like many teams in pro sports now, didn't much like change. And I said, you know, that's, that, that can't be done because it's illegal for a non-doctor to hand out prescription pills. And that was something that was, you know, very painful for the team because it changed the way that they operated. Okay, great. Dr. Heisinger was a medical reformer then, but he maintains he still understands why doctors feel conflicted about where their first responsibility lies. Well, I think that when you're standing on the sidelines and you're running out of a, a tunnel and you're hearing 105,000 people screaming and you realize that you want to wear a Super Bowl ring just as badly as the players that you're taking care of, it's very, very difficult not to act differently toward them. He says it's why he wrote a tell-all book about his career as an NFL team doctor entitled, You're Okay, It's Just a Bruise. And that book eventually would lead to this. Any given Sunday, life is a contact sport. Football is a game of seconds and inches. Movie director Oliver Stone's football classic, Any Given Sunday, was based on Heizanga's book, depicting the brutality of pro football. The film also blew the whistle on the pressure he and other team doctors feel to compromise their Hippocratic oath. In this scene, actor Matthew Modine plays the character based on Rob Heizanga. Go on, get out of here, you're done. Yeah. Have another shot, Doc. Yeah. You don't need it. It doesn't make any sense. Medically. Give a shit about medical, Doc. Yeah. But that's the real-life dilemma for team doctors. Which comes first, patients or employers? The players or the team? Well, I think a team physician needs to be a doctor for the players. And unfortunately, in many cases up to this point, they've been the doctor for the owner, or sometimes worse yet, a doctor for the NFL, a multi-billion dollar company. It's no secret the NFL is the world's richest sports league. And it's no shock that companies pay millions to get their products the exclusive National Football League stamp of approval, the NFL's official beer. Official NFL credit card. Use your Visa card for a chance to win it. Official NFL soup. I've been chosen as the next Campbell's Chunky Mama's Boy. And now, believe it or not, official team doctors. All right, he checks out okay. All right, good luck. Thanks a lot. You may be surprised to learn the majority of National Football League franchises and many teams in the NHL and other sports award the rights to be their exclusive medical provider or health care company. And when injuries happen, the team that takes care of the Tampa Bay Lightning is there to take care of your team as well. Florida Medical Clinic. Your life. Our specialty. In other words, medical practices or hospitals attract patients by marketing themselves as the official physicians for big league teams, paying rights fees of hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars a year. I really think it does make a big difference when healthcare organizations, clinics, large medical practices are competing to say we're the uh, healthcare providers for TMAX. Arthur Kaplan is with the Sports and Society program at New York University. He says those exclusive rights agreements can put even more stress on the relationship between a team and the physicians treating its players. In the context of the enormous business that is professional sports, let's just say, in North America, trying to practice medicine as part of a team, knowing that they don't have to bring you back next year if they don't like what you did, maybe they're charging you for the privilege of the honor of doing it, 
Boy, that puts you in a tough ethical bind. According to Dr. David Yerlink of Toronto's Sunnybrook Hospital, it potentially can lead to a fundamental conflict of interest. D does that compromise, in your view, the Hippocratic Oath and, and the primary emphasis that should be there on the patient? I, I think it, it has to, to a certain degree. I mean, as soon as money, and especially large amounts of money, enter that equation, uh, it's very easy mm -hmm. for people to trick themselves into thinking that um, what they're doing is consistent with the Hippocratic Oath, when in fact what they're doing is operating a business instead. After the break, prescription for disaster. You said you didn't prescribe I'm not, analgesics. I'm not, I have no comment. But, but all those prescriptions for Ambien? I have no comment. When, when that was prohibited in his aftercare agreement, you knew he was addicted to it? National Hockey League player Derek Bugard had a drug problem, addicted to painkillers and the sleeping aid Ambien. But he had another problem. The Minnesota Wild team doctors were the ones who'd prescribed many of those drugs for him in the first place. It was September 2009 when Bugard was admitted to the NHL substance abuse program, ordered into rehab in California. Bugard, I think, is six foot seven, folks. He's a huge fan. But three weeks later, he was back on the ice again, released from rehab after signing this aftercare agreement. First condition, no medications, drugs, or alcohol, unless specifically approved by his doctors. His father, Len Bugard, says that was doomed from the start. And to your knowledge, did he live up to that agreement? No, not at all. Bugard takes him on it. But outwardly, at least, Derek was back in fighting form because he was about to become a free agent and there were teams willing to pay top dollar to lure the NHL's biggest, most fearsome player. One team in particular pulled out all the stops, producing a personalized recruiting video. Derek Bugard, now is your chance to experience it, to live it, to make history of your own as one of us. That marketing campaign worked. Derek Bugard chose the bright lights in Big City, signing a four-year, $6.5 million contract to play in New York. But his fresh start in Manhattan in 2010 wouldn't last long. When he arrived at training camp overweight and out of shape, his father told Ranger management Derek was abusing drugs again. What had you hoped would happen? They would get a hold of the substance abuse uh, doctors and, uh, you know, saying, hey, you know, this is the problem that we're having, or, you know, that Derek has relapsed. So, you know, he needs uh, further treatment. But what in fact happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. Derek was becoming a New York fan and media favorite. This was from a magazine fashion shoot. And even after that reported relapse, he wasn't disciplined. He wasn't even sent back to rehab. Though they were warned he was in violation of his aftercare agreement, the Rangers began giving him more drugs. In just over a month, five prescriptions for the painkiller hydrocodone, 64 tablets in all. And remarkably, it wasn't just New York doctors. Bugard was now a Ranger, but still in touch with his old team doctors in Minnesota. On visits to Minneapolis, he would contact Dr. Dan Peterson of The Wild. Derek would text him or phone him. And, you know, the following day, Derek picked up a prescription for Ambien. So it just became a pattern. It becomes a pattern. It basically looks like Dilodope. Dr. David Yerlink of Sunnybrook Hospital and the University of Toronto. What are the ethical issues involved in something like that? Well, uh, the idea that you... VIP or not can send a text to a doctor who's not your regular physician and get a prescription for a, a rewarding and abusable substance mm -hmm. is uh, it's unconscionable and I don't think any physician would should feel comfortable writing a prescription like that. But a number of prescriptions like that were written for Derek Bugard in 2010 and 11 
by Dr. Dan Peterson. So he kept writing him prescriptions, even though that's correct. He was addicted, and in particular, um, it had to do with uh, Derek was, uh, you know, he was addicted to Ambien. When our interview requests were declined, we went to Dan Peterson's medical office outside Minneapolis. I think you know we'd like to talk to you about Derek Bugard and the prescriptions you wrote for him just the year that he died. Dr. Peterson wouldn't discuss those medications, so we went looking for his boss, Minnesota Wild Medical Director Sheldon Burns. Not only does this 64-year-old family physician keep up a busy practice in Edina, but he's also certified in emergency and sports medicine. This video was made when Dr. Burns was chosen the state's family physician of the year. We wanted to ask about his prescription practices. However, when I introduced myself, Dr. Burns walked away. He wouldn't talk to us either. Back in New York, early in 2011, when Len Bugard went to visit his son, the toll of drug abuse was obvious. Len was shocked by the disarray he found in Derek's apartment and his life. His apartment itself, the, it, was, it was just a pigsty. Uh, there were uh, takeout containers, you know, scattered about the apartment, uh, you know, in, uh, in his bedroom. There was a pile of clothes, must be about three, four feet in height, just a pile. So, yeah, no, it, was, uh, it was a disaster. Then he saw the bottle of Ambien pills. Len calculated Derek had taken four tablets in the previous 24 hours, an excessive amount. And remember, he was an Ambien addict. And uh, so I looked at it, and it was uh, Ambien, and it was prescribed by Dr. Wiseman. Team doctor. The team doctor. In the period of about four months, Derek Bugard got a total of 10 prescriptions for Ambien, written by New York Ranger team doctors. 244 tablets in all, the majority from Dr. Ronald Weissman. I think what really stands out is in the last few months of his life, the um, enormous number of tablets he was prescribed for the sleeping pill Ambien. Uh, it's more than unusual. It's it's dangerous. I mean, the quantities of Ambien here are extraordinary. When the Rangers refused to allow anyone to speak with us, we went to Dr. Weissman's office. Dr. Weissman. Hi, my name is Bob McEwen. I'm with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Hi. Hi. Um, I think you may know we've been trying to convince you to talk to us. You know, let me just tell you what we want to know. Yeah, you, you, are you just coming here to see you. the doctors? <laughs> no, just see you. In? No, I was waiting for you. <laughs> okay. um, we want to talk about your prescriptions for Derek Bugard. You said you didn't prescribe I'm analgesics. I'm not, I have no comments. But, but all those prescriptions for Ambien? I have no comments. When, when that was prohibited in his aftercare agreement, you knew he was addicted to it? Is there a plausible explanation for all of that Ambien being prescribed by the team doctors? Not a good one. I mean, the, the overriding rule of medical practice is first do no harm. Mm -hmm. And in the situation you've just described, it's very difficult to accept that he was given these drugs to the extent that he was. Especially, he says, if there was reason to suspect the drugs could be abused. I think a physician who is knowingly giving drugs like this to a patient, uh, knowing that the patient's misusing them, uh, should have some difficulty sleeping at night. And if they don't, they might want to ask themselves why that is. And by 2011, Derek Bugard's abuse of Ambien had taken a dramatic turn. No longer a sleeping aid for him, but a high like cocaine or heroin. He was crushing them up and snorting them. We know that, right? Jeremy Clark is a fellow Canadian who became Derek's trainer and friend in Minnesota. When Derek was a ranger, he came to New York to help, though it didn't always work. So obviously he was, he, we were working together. He was taking, taking a lot of Ambien, and every time he took one, it just got, it got worse. And by the end of the night, he was hammered.
Derek Bugard's condition should have come as no surprise to anyone in New York. The Rangers knew all about his addictive history when they gave him that big contract. No sooner had he arrived than he started to hound the team trainers for Ambien and other drugs. But though his father told the Rangers Derek had relapsed, and New York general manager Glenn Sather threatened to trade him, team doctors kept writing prescriptions for him. And then there were the drug tests. In the next few months, Derek tested positive six times for painkillers and other medication. Yet still, the New York Rangers and the National Hockey League effectively did nothing. It all came to a head at a Ranger practice early in April. His biographer, John Branch of the New York Times. You know, when he got back on the ice at one point that he basically couldn't stand up and was falling down. And they realized the Rangers then, at that point, could not ignore it any longer, um, if you are to argue that they ignored it for a long time. This was proof in front of them, in front of team officials, there's something wrong with this guy. He can no longer even stand up on the ice. And so they called his agent and got him into substance abuse rehabilitation then for the second time in his career. So it was that by the spring of 2011, Derek Bugard was back in California in rehab. You always have hope. You know, I, I never thought that things were going to go the way they went, obviously. Veteran NHL agent Ron Salser had represented Bugard since his rookie year. During that second rehab stint, Salser took his client for lunch and a pep talk. I try to be strong with him and say, Derek, what are you doing? I mean, you worked so hard to get where you are. And as I'm talking, his eyes are just welling up and tears are just flowing out. And I'm Looking at him, I know I'm, I'm hitting home and I'm having an impact on him. I, I don't want to do this, but I feel like I need to tell him, straighten yourself out. But once more, after just a few weeks of treatment, Bugard was allowed a temporary absence from rehab. The plan was to accompany his two brothers to their sister's college graduation. He arrived in Minneapolis on May the 12th, 2011. Rehab seemingly a dim memory. On the itinerary, one of his favorite bars, Sneaky Pete's, right next door to the Dream Girls Strip Club. There were pills and booze. Just before dawn, his friend Jeremy Clark finally put Derek to bed. Later that day, Friday, May 13th, Clark and his wife were just waking up when their phone rang. It was Derek's younger brother, Aaron. Aaron called? Uh... Yeah, it's the screaming that he was dead. So we jumped in the car and flew downtown and he was still there, he was still in the bed, right? None of it made sense because he was just, it was, you know, he should be hung over, he should be dead, like I don't get it. In California, Agent Ron Salser also got a call from Derek's older brother, Ryan. Derek is dead, Derek is dead, Ronnie, he's dead, Derek is dead, he just kept screaming it. And I just was totally incredulous, you know, you go into like, no, I'm not hearing this, this can't be happening. When we return, who's responsible? And what's the solution? I read a survey once that said Olympic athletes would end their lives at 30 if they could win a gold medal. I mean, like I said, you would take what your doctor tells you as gospel and just and run with it. You know, doc, is this okay? Yeah, you're fine. Okay. After Derek Bugard's death in 2011, there was a memorial at the home rink of the Minnesota Wild. The lingering question, how could this happen to a 28-year-old professional athlete in what should have been the prime of his life? Derek's dad, Len, says he still can't help blaming himself. The feeling that you could have protected him in some way? It's, it's, it's always that case. Uh, I think, like, you know, hindsight's 2020. you know, what, what could I have done? Why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do that, you know? And, you know, the opposite end in the spectrum now, I guess, is that I look at this as this is the one last thing that I can do for him. So. 
His investigation had uncovered that disturbing record of all the medications Derek received, most from his own team doctors, prescriptions other physicians called astonishing, unconscionable, dangerous. Arthur Kaplan of the Sports and Society Program at New York University. Yeah, I think it's pretty clear to me in talking to people who've been team doctors that ethically they want to say we're there for the player and health is first. But that's not the reality of pro sports. The reality of pro sports is winning is first because money is first. Kaplan says the problem is compounded by the fact that the winning is first reality is shared by many elite athletes. I read a survey once that said Olympic athletes would end their lives at 30 if they could win a gold medal. So we're talking about a group that is not interested in hearing about risks, they're interested in winning. Dr. David Yerlink of Toronto's Sunnybrook Hospital. What about personal responsibility? Here you have Derek Bugard. Uh, he's hounding the trainers, he's hounding the doctors, his and, and others. He's got black market sources. What about personal responsibility here? Let's not heap it all on the poor team doctor. Oh, I agree completely. I think that uh, uh, it's easy to blame drug companies, it's easy to blame doctors, and you know, the problem here is that the drugs that, that Derek Bugard was, was given in, in large quantities are, they're inherently reinforcing. They tend in the right patient or in the wrong patient to lead to patterns of use like his, and what he needed was help. It all adds up to a medical minefield in professional sports. The question is, how do you balance those issues, legal, ethical, and competitive, if you're a multi-billion dollar franchise with multi-million dollar athletes? For example, if you're the San Francisco 49ers. Remember how former NFL All-Pro Jeremy Newbury described the 49ers pre-game assembly line for painkillers a few years ago? The doctors say led to his kidney failure. They just got, you know, 30 needles lined up and guys would walk by to stick you, wipe you with a cloth and you keep walking. Was he your doctor or was he their doctor? He was definitely the team's doctor and they work, you know, for the team and, and their primary goal, you know, was to keep you on a football field, not your long-term health. Did this ever get discussed with the physician at the time? No. I mean, like I said, I mean, you would take what your doctor tells you as gospel and just and run with it. You know, doc, is this okay? Yeah, you're fine. Okay. But since Jeremy Newbury retired in 2009, his former team has taken a dramatic new direction, a partnership with nearby Stanford University that could be a medical game changer for pro sports. Simply put, San Francisco pays Stanford to provide health care services to the 49er players. There's no rights fee, no marketing agreement, and those physicians are answerable, not to the NFL team, but directly to the university. I mean, we don't push drugs to get people back on the field. Dr. William Maloney is a Stanford medical professor and 49er team doctor. And I think the mistake sometimes occurs where you want to become you want to have a relationship with that athlete that's different than a patient-doctor relationship, and I think that's a mistake. And Dr. Maloney says the new system has weaned the 49ers from prescription pain medication. So what might that mean if confronted with a case like Derek Bugart's, as the Minnesota Wild and New York Rangers were? Should the alarm bells have been going off in, in some In my experience, that wouldn't, wouldn't happen. Um, I can't imagine a situation where someone would get that much narcotics and would still be on the ice or on the football field or on the basketball court. Unimaginable, perhaps, but it's what happened to Derek Bugard. And narcotic painkillers remain an integral part of professional sport. John Branch of the New York Times. Nobody is willing to step up and take responsibility. Um, for a team doctor... You're thinking, I get paid for, or I work for the owners of this team, and they want this guy back on the ice. It's an investment. It's a business investment to them. What, do I, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to go tell the owner we can't take care of this guy for these reasons? Which brings us back to Len Bugard's search for accountability. In September 2014, it led to this. When U.S. federal agents arrested Jordan Hart 
who'd also become addicted to painkillers in pro hockey. After retirement, Hart kept getting prescriptions from a member of the medical staff of his old minor league team. Both now are charged for their roles in supplying those pills to Derek Bugard. But otherwise, there have been no charges laid, no apologies from Derek's teams or doctors. The only public statement from the NHL that it is not aware of an overprescription problem. It seems the game hasn't changed quite yet. So what's their number one priority? You know, shouldn't it be the athlete? Shouldn't it be what's you know, what's best for the athlete as opposed to, you know, the, the club, you know, t- uh, how much money they can make is what it boils down to. It's an entertainment business, so, and the bottom line is, is money. 